on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight on Piers Morgan Uncensored, Truss and Biden shake on the special relationship because standing up to Russia be their first priority. Putin threatens nuclear war and tells the West this is not a bluff. So will the world blink or stare him down? I'll take on a Putin puppet in Moscow. And Dr. Jordan Peterson, one of the most fascinating polemics on the planet, gives his shocking verdict on Ukraine's war. There's a bit of Hitler and Stalin and everyone. A bit of Hitler normal. and everyone? Really? There's more than a bit. Live from London, this is Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. For days we've been hearing that Vladimir Putin is on the ropes. Brave Ukrainians, backed by our military muscle, have taken back control of thousands of square miles of their country. We're told that Putin's patched-up army is battered, bloody and losing the will to fight. Even his propagandists, known for spewing hate and lies on state TV, have dared to question their dictator. And tonight, five British prisoners of war detained in eastern Ukraine have been released. So Putin is clearly in trouble. There's nothing as dangerous as a wounded bear. And today he warned, in more chilling terms than ever, that the price for his humiliation could be nuclear war. 300,000 reservists in Russia will now be mobilised in the biggest escalation since the invasion. Make no mistake, this is a dangerous moment for the world. It would be foolish not to think very carefully about grave threats from either a bad man or a madman armed with more nukes than any country in the world. Where somebody bends over backwards to keep telling you this is not a bluff usually sounds an awful lot like a bluff. We can't live in a world where a guy like Putin, sabre-rattling his nuclear arsenal, can just get away with mass murder by scaring us off. This might be Putin's last roll of the dice. We don't know yet. My view is now is not the time to blink. It's the time to double down in our support for the Ukrainians. Well, by chance, I sat down to interview one of the most fascinating thinkers on the planet today, Dr Jordan Peterson, one of the most riveting and emotional interviews I think I've ever done. We're going to air it all in full on Tuesday. But later in the show, we're going to share his grave and extraordinary analysis of the situation in Ukraine. Here's a taster. We can't win against Vladimir Putin anyways, because you cannot win against someone you cannot say no to. Interesting stuff from Jordan Peterson. Well, let's start by going to New York, and I'll talk to the political editor, Kate McCann. Kate, uh, good to see you. A bit of delay, I know, on the on the sound tonight, so I'll just keep this, the question simple. Liz Truss has just met with President Biden, our new Prime Minister. He congratulated her on her position. He also gave great, uh, I thought, really lovely tribute to our Queen and how much she and the First Lady had enjoyed coming back uh, to London to be at the funeral and uh, how stunned they were by the, the scale of the uh, warmth and feeling from the British people towards Her Majesty. Liz Truss returned uh, the, the favour by saying to him how grateful she was that he'd come over and said that the Queen was the great rock of this country. It had been a very difficult two weeks. They are, of course, the two weeks that started her premiership. So initial feelings, Kate, about body language between these two people, the special relationship. Where's this all going, do you think, from the, the, these early encounters? So I think the special relationship is so deeply embedded in the way the state works here in America and in the UK that the reality is the UK is one of the US's best allies. It's ready to go at the touch of a button. And what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, as you just set out there, Piers, makes that even more important than ever. The reality of the security situation is that organizations like the UN, where we are today, the G7 and others, even though their financial power as nations is dwindling, that actually means that they need to now work more closely together. And they recognize that. They can see an enemy now in Russia. They can see the allies of Russia, China, what might happen next in Taiwan. That is laid out very clearly, always, but particularly here at the United Nations. And those conversations on the margins and in the bilaterals that you're seeing here are dominated by talk of Ukraine. What happens next? Yes, 
the hard-won battles to regain territory, but also how to rebuild Ukraine. Hundreds of billions of dollars worth of damage done, whether that comes from Russia. And as you say there, there are some suggesting that now is the time for NATO to be far braver, to go further, to arm Ukraine in order to try and draw some kind of line under what's happening here. So the body language between Liz Truss and President Biden, relatively warm. Those discussions at the top of meetings on camera are always a bit awkward and stilted. Everybody's reading out their comments from their bit of paper, trying to get across to a domestic and an international audience what they want to achieve. But the reality is the bedrock of that relationship is very stable, very solid and very important, perhaps more important than ever. And that's what Liz Truss, the new prime minister, wants to build on in her speech here tonight. She wants to say that more than ever, the economic power of big nations like the UK and the US needs to be drawn together in the G7 and other organizations and effectively used as skillfully as defensive power against Russia. Now, that is a big ask. It's going to be difficult to do, but there is a real grit and determination here and some strong language behind the scenes from diplomats too about Russia. They won't want to comment on camera about that nuclear message from Putin. They don't want to give it credibility, but it is at the forefront of everybody's minds. It will not, though, make them waver in their task. Right. As you were talking there, we've got a clip just come in, actually, of Prime Minister Truss and President Biden. Let's take a little look at this. You are our closest ally in the world. And there's a lot we can do, continue to do together. And there's no issue that I can think of a global consequence where the United States and the United Kingdom are not working in cooperation. And that's why we want to work more closely uh, with the United States, especially on energy security, on our economic security, but also in reaching out to fellow democracies around the world to make sure that democracies prevail. I mean, the one thing, of course, which is a massive uh, issue between them and probably won't even be discussed is this long promised trade deal between the UK and the US, which Biden has basically said is a non-starter. Yeah, and I think that's why you saw Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, on the plane on the way over here, before the wheels had even touched down in New York, trying to set expectations around a trade deal. Because there's been some suggestion here in America that the idea of a trade deal is linked to the outcome of talks over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Everyone, essentially, on all sides, digging in on that particular issue. But it does need to be solved, and it needs to be solved quickly, because there needs to be a government back up and running, power sharing, an agreement, something to move politics forward. So it's on the forefront of everybody's minds here, and it's something that President Biden is very keen to ensure that people understand his commitment to the Good Friday Agreement, and Liz Truss too, of course, has her position on that. So those talks are always very difficult in terms of the domestic agenda, but I think there is a sense that both countries realize and recognize that they do need to work together here, and trade is an issue, of course, dominating the Northern Ireland Protocol talks, but that at some point will be dominating the relationship between the UK and the US. Liz Truss very clearly on the plane saying that trade deal is not going to come anytime soon. She did that so that the message here from these talks couldn't be that deal's off the table until you sort the Northern Ireland issue. But the reality is, Piers, there are other issues with trade between the UK and the US that also complicate that deal. Attitudes to tariffs, for example, complicated, as those negotiations always are, which may well slow that down. But every time we have asked on both the US side and the UK side about a trade deal, the message is very clear. It doesn't exist right now. Nothing to talk about. Nothing to see here. It will exist one day, but those talks aren't even on the table yet. Okay, McCann in New York, thank you very much indeed. Well, joining me now to discuss a number of things today, former newspaper editor she uh, Emily Sheffield, conservative commentator Esther Kraku, and royal commentator and former press secretary for our late great queen, uh, Dickie Arbiter. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Dickie, let me start with you. Twelve years you were the press secretary for Her Majesty. This must have been for you personally a very long and sad and reflective ten days. It was long, it was sad, it was reflected. I didn't quite get my head around it until I saw the hearse leaving Balmoral Castle. And then again it hit me when the RF regiment's pallbearers took it off the C-17 at Northolt Airport. There were several moments when I nearly lost it. Uh, I was working for an Australian channel mm. and um, uh, Ali sort of grabbed my hand at once. Ali Langdon from Ali the Langdon, Show, yeah. yeah. She, she grabbed my hand because she saw that something was afoot. And I'm very grateful to her for having done that. And that was when the coffin was being lowered into the royal um, crypt. 
at St George's Temple. Yeah, it was an incredibly poignant moment. I mean, that was the moment, really, I felt, of finality, the final moment where we would ever see this Queen in any form. It was our final moment to say goodbye and thank you, Your Majesty. Would she have been surprised by the sheer scale of outpouring of love and affection? Probably, not? yes, because every time there was a jubilee, she stood on that balcony and the crowd stretched all the way from Buckingham Palace back to Trafalgar Square, and it was huge, a million people, and she never quite believed it. I mean, it happened uh, mm. on her golden jubilee, her, her diamond and her platinum, and it was something that she really didn't believe. I mean, she almost echoed the words of her grandfather, George V, the mm. people love me. Um, and what came to mind while, while, you were, while you were talking is that George V was called Grandpa England, and I'd like to think that late Queen was Grandma England. Yes, absolutely. Um, Emily, a lot of issues coming out of all this. One is this concept being put out that Charles may want a sort of downsized coronation. If that is true, what is your view of that? Well, I don't know what it's downsizing from, but... I, mean, I... imagine, in other words, compare it to the Queen's, it won't be as lavish or ostentatious. As the Queen's when she was coronated, yes. not, not her funeral. Um, again, I'm not entirely sure how lavish it was, but I think we've just... It was pretty seen... lavish. It well, was, I, I think somewhere it. in yeah, the... Yeah, you saw it. I saw it. I think somewhere I, in the I middle... Forget, Dick, you, you don't look as old as, <laughs> as I know you are. Um, well, there's an interesting question, isn't it? I mean, my gut feeling about this is if you're going to have a monarchy, do it properly. The great thing about the last 10 days was being able to show the world that nobody has anything anywhere like this. So if you start downsizing everything, you kind of end up where a lot of European monarchies went, which it becomes so downsized it becomes pointless. There are certain things in the service you've got to have. You've got to have the anointing, you've got to have the crowning. The crowning might not be the same as late Queen's, where the crown was, uh, St Edward's crown was placed on a head. It might be raised over, over King Charles's head and then placed on a cushion. A symbolic crowning. And there'll be two crownings because Camilla will be crowned the Queen Consort. She right? will be crowned the Queen Consort. You, you don't, don't start chipping away at tradition. No, I don't think so. You know, no, if... The only thing I would warn, maybe, is when the Queen was coronated, this was a young woman, a yeah. very good-looking young woman, mm. who had it, the, the shock of her father's death meant that she was suddenly escalated yeah. to her role as running the monarchy, head of the monarchy. Charles is not going to have the same... Glamour, but isn't that even say. more reason and, to well, make no, it because, look as glamorous as possible? Well, yes, make it look glamorous, but be careful you don't overprint okay. it. Okay, because... let's move to another another ongoing running sore, Esther. We've talked about this many times. Meghan and Harry <laughs> can't be ignored again. Their friend Gail King, best friends with Oprah Winfrey, who of course actually was the enabler for a lot of this stuff. With people that, actually friends. Uh, are these that, people ever? Actually well, Gail and Oprah are great friends. Yeah. Yeah. And the Sussexes are neighbours of Oprah, so they sort of... I think Meghan's hijacked them as friends as well. Um, Here's the point, though. Gail King said on American television this morning that she believes nothing's really been resolved. Let's take a look. Big families always go through drama, always go through turmoil. It remains to be seen. Are they going to be drawn closer together or are they going to be drawn apart? I have no idea. I have no inside information on that. But I will tell you this. It was good to see Harry standing with his family. I mean, it was, but I'm not sure anything got resolved. Yeah, I think it's too early to tell. I think, obviously, everyone is waiting with bated breath over Harry's book, um, which Mm. I really hope is not as sort of bombastic as we fear it will be. And, obviously, you know, Meghan's podcast, let's hope she doesn't say anything more egregious about her family. I read today, it's probably not true, but it was an interesting sort of take on it, that she's busy going through all the podcasts trying to remove anything that attacks the monarchy because she now knows how badly that would play. The problem they've got... I think Dickie in this, is that that's really their only currency, which is worth all the money. They don't have any other currency. They've already rubbished the royal family. And how you pull back from that, I really don't know. You talk about reconciliation. There's a very wide chasm. There isn't a bridge big enough yeah. to bridge right. that chasm. And William, I didn't see William give Harry a single glance the entire time they were seen in public, let alone Kate and... And Megan, it looked to me like they were putting this show on to, to, yeah. to do it for their grandmother and credit to them for being able to do that. But the enmity between them all is incredibly real. I mean, yeah, this is not I, invented by the media. I do think that King Charles and the Prince of Wales have done the right thing, which is to put the olive branch out because yeah. they need to be the grown-ups in the room. Yes. Absolutely. Megan and Harry 
like bitching about the royal neutralize that and they need to do it fast well they need I to shut up don't they i mean they just yes, need to they, I, they left I, the country in duty for freedom i think they've done right, the so first go and have bit. your freedom and privacy and shut up trashing I, the I rules i do hope i do hope they do reconcile because i think mm. it'll be a positive thing for every everyone i would advise Meghan and harry to find some sort of expertise like i don't know get a degree in neurobiology or something because, <laughs> because when you're only relevant i don't think harry going to get any neurobiology well, you know, when your only relevance stems from being in the royal family in Meghan's case for yeah. two years you you kind of want a backup plan. Let, let's, I think, unfortunately, think... Megan is going to keep capitalising on what she's been capitalising on so far. Yeah. She's got a title, she's got a, a captive audience in the United States. I mean, her, the Sussex squad were tweeting in America that she was the only one <laughs> who shed a tear. Oh, no, I know, it's ridiculous. Um, let's turn to something happier, because I, I find there's a limited amount of time we can give them before everyone's spleen start to <laughs> vent. And the pallbearers, Dickie, I found unbelievably moving. I've been reading all about <coughs> these pallbearers. Um, young men, the finest of this uh, first battalion, Grenadier Guards, were chosen for this duty. And, and flown it, in specially from Iraq. Flown in from Iraq in many cases. Many of them had done uh, war tours and so on. But they were chosen. I can't think of a more pressurised thing to do, actually, other than actually engaging in real war, <laughs> than what these guys did. With the, you're right there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more urgent water, please, for Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't think of a, of a bigger honour for these guys or a bigger responsibility or more stress to have a billion people around the world watching as you are carrying a very... Four billion. Well, for, well I, I, I think that probably was an exaggeration, but the, the reality is a lot. And this is a very heavy coffin and it's carrying the greatest monarch in history. The pressure not to make any mistake, enormous... They were completely faultless. And the country, I think, recognised that. My question is, should the country go further and recognise them with, with honours for what Absolutely. they do? Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Um, you know, honours have been given to people for lesser things. Mm. This was a great moment. It was a great moment in their lives. It was a great moment in our mm. lives. And it was a great moment for the royal family. Are we all they agreed on this? Yeah, absolutely. We all were just discussing on. backstage, weren't we? whether it went MBE, OBE, and you thought MBE. I think as a start, it's an MBE. I agree. Because then they can lift up. Eight MBEs would be the least we can give them, and congratulations yeah. to them and to their families. They must have been bursting with pride. But imagine being the parent of one of those kids, watching yeah. and thinking, please, don't yeah, let I, anything I, go wrong. You, you're talking about the, heavy, the heaviness of, of the coffin. Mm. An American tweeted me and said, what are they making so much fun? They're only carrying a box. I tweeted back and said, it's lead-lined. Yeah. Now go away. Oh, exactly. Yeah. You get idiots on Twitter. You should stay off Twitter, Dickie. You're, you're far too venerable for that kind of behaviour. <laughs> no, I get um, annoyed. <laughs> Dickie, it's great to see you. I wanted to catch up with you because I'm sure you've been through a lot of emotions in the last mm -hmm. uh, couple of weeks. And um, it's, it was a historic moment. I think the country did the Queen proud. The country did the Queen proud. The, the people were magnificent. There was no angst in the queue. Not a few celebrities allegedly jumping the queue. But they were, they were all very friendly. They were all very relaxed. When somebody had to go out of the queue, perhaps to go to the loo or be interviewed on television, they got their place back in the queue. There was what? no squeezing up. You weren't impressed by the queue jumpers? No, not particularly. Mm. I thought David Beckham was brilliant, mm. queuing up for 14 hours. Yeah. We won't talk about the others. <laughs> uh, do you watch the, the, the chase on TV? The chase? The, the quiz show. No, should I? I? Love it. Well, you, you're about to be replaced by one of the chasers in that seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but given you don't watch it, you won't take it as a personal insult. No, uh, no, no. Great to see you, Dickie. You too. Thanks we'll for catch our scene. You two stay with me. We're going to bring in Anne Hegarty, of course, from The Chase, one of the great chasers, to replace the irreplaceable Dickie Alder. Good to see you. Still ahead tonight, more of my exclusive interview with controversial clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson, getting why he thinks there's a dangerous dictator in all of us. There's a bit of Hitler and Stalin in everyone. A bit of Hitler normal. in everyone? Really? There's more than a bit.
Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Emily Sheffield, Esther Crack is still here. Plus, very exciting this. I've been joined by Anne Hegarty, the quizzer extraordinaire and intellectual powerhouse star of TV quiz show The Chase. Nice to be here. Are you as are you as mean and absolutely sinister and intimidating <laughs> in real I'm, life? I'm horrible. <laughs> Well, it's lovely to see you. Thank you. A very unexpected little bonus. Uh, and talking of bonuses, I want to start with bankers' bonuses. Mm -hmm. I don't know why Liz Truss's first priority for this country appears to be letting bankers get richer. Well, because let's say a bank makes a certain amount of profit. If it hangs on to that profit, then it has to pay corporation tax on it at, what, 19%? If instead it gives some of that profit to its employees then they have to pay income tax on it on, what is it, 45%. At 45%, so more money goes into the Treasury. But ultimately, when you have food banks exploding, mm -hmm. when you have food prices, energy prices crippling families, the optics of saying, actually, one of the first things we're going to do is let bankers get richer, so I the, think is really... It might, it might be something that works. Have so to wait the and more see. money goes but into bad, the Treasury. But it's bad politics. I, I quite agree some people aren't going to like the optics of it, but I think that we can tolerate a lot of red-faced young men throwing bread rolls at each other in the ivy if it actually means that more money goes into the Treasury. I mean, it's an and interesting point. They actually make less money because the, the logic is if because bankers' actual salaries have gone up because they've capped the bonuses. So it's actually made them less, um, less risk-averse, which they should be. So if you actually you know, remove the cap, their base salary goes down and it makes them actually behave but better. But the problem we had with the financial crash before was that the bonuses were getting so stratospherically big, they all began behaving recklessly. Yeah, but then the industry was heavily regulated, so now there are more regulations to actually police that sort of behaviour. But don't change their spots. I, I mean, I've nothing so. against bankers personally, but give them a load of cash... But and this they, doesn't actually necessarily ..trouble is going to start. Richer. Emily, am I wrong? Well, I think that it's... This hasn't been much around the regulation. So, as you say, back to the financial crash, mostly in America, mm. and subprime, they were getting huge bonuses for not delivering anything. Right. So we do need to keep the... I, I think it's right. They should be allowed to be paid whatever bonus the bank thinks right. But make sure there's some regulation that they're getting the bonus for delivering. Exactly. And I, to your point, yes, it's the politics of envy if you say everyone should be paid a certain amount and that money does go out. It goes into restaurants in London, for instance, who are having an absolutely terrible time at the moment. Yeah. But to your point about the politics... I don't think she meant this to be leaked out. Right. I think there's a lot of frustration. Actually, the Sunday Times reported on that. Because, of course, that's not the first thing you want to come out. But Labour can leap on list, this now, it? especially when you're talking that they don't want to do a windfall. She doesn't want to do a windfall Well, that, tax again, why, why would you also brief that you're not going to tax the energy companies? Because they're the first people I'd be putting a windfall tax on. So... Is it, look, it's a bold strategy if it works. If it goes wrong, but, you'd look back and say, well, why would you announce those two things? Well, she, A, she didn't. It was a leak. Apparently yeah. she was very cross about that bank. Well, that in itself may be a disingenuous leak. No, and then in itself, if one of her own team leaked it, you've got to think, can you trust your own team? Yeah. Yeah. Or are they Boris's people? And is there actually and a lot more trust trouble? you wouldn't trust people as far as I can exactly. party. Uh, let's, she, let's, maybe she thinks she can. Well, let's talk about... You mentioned envy there. Um, look, Holly and Phil and this extraordinary developing scandal that these two very popular morning television presenters jumped the queue, as people see it, uh, by using a media pass to bypass having to queue up with the public. What do you think of this? Well, the point, as I have made exhaustively on Twitter, <laughs> is that... Everything on Twitter is exhausting. Uh, yes, we have to, we really have to accept is. that. Uh, I've been muting a lot of people. So <laughs> there'll be people shouting at me right now that I can't hear. <laughs> um, but, um, yes, as I understand it, they were heading down the side of Westminster Hall mm. to go to the press area mm. because they had media accreditation, along with hundreds of other people, most of them people we happen not, in fact, to recognise. Mm. So there were, I mean, I know there were, there were journalists, there was a journalist from Yorkshire. See, I know, exactly uh, I mean, Susanna thing. Reid, who was my, my former TV wife, she queued <laughs> with her mum for, you know, 10 hours, whatever it was. Because David, she wanted to. David because Beckham she wasn't queued. working. I, no, I know, but my, I don't think any of the journalists actually should have skipped the main queue, personally. I don't think anyone should have done it, apart from world leaders where literally, you know, they've only got an hour well, or so. I don't think that MPs and members of the House of Lords should be, well, should I agree. be allowed no, to Well, I agree. But we have to be able to do it. four friends. Having, but the but media said, were not skipping said, said, the queue at all. Right. They were simply walking down the hall to do it. But having said that, I also don't think that the pylon has been fair. 
and I don't think they should be fired, as some people seem mm. to want to do. This petition is up to 35,000 people. At the front page of every paper, like it's the biggest scandal of all time. It's like, look, they made, in my opinion, a misjudgment, as every journalist did that did this, because the public were doing their duty, yeah. and it looked like the journalists weren't. So well, I think I, that was the error of judgment. But the reaction has been absurd. But also, we've just had the most... We've all been talking. I was here only, what, two nights ago, talking about the unity of the, the, the funeral. Yeah. And what, this is the outcome? Seriously. Yeah. Well, Britain is that great is at... so pathetic Britain is great so at queuing. Have you ever tried to jump in the queue at Alton Towers? It oh, doesn't, it doesn't yeah, go well. Seriously, no, this um, is the takeaway. In, in, but you know, two about days later. walking past the queue. Well, there is a benefit. Having nothing to do there with the There is a benefit from the whole thing. London Dungeon has announced that if you go down to London Dungeon and use the uh, password, Holly and Phil, <laughs> you get fast-tracked in past the queue. <laughs> a lot Excellent. of companies trading on this. You uh, are genius. I'm going to uh, do let's, that. I want to talk to Esther, if I may, about uh, PETA, the, um, the animal rights group, yeah. who've announced uh, that apparently um, meat-eaters should be banned from having sex. Uh, and their explanation is that devouring sausages and schnitzel, this is the German Peter announced this, is a symptom of toxic masculinity killing the planet. They called on women to go on sex strike to save the world, and they cited research saying that men cause 41% more greenhouse gas emissions than women because they consume more meat. I would hazard a guess that <laughs> the people having the best sex are probably people that do eat meat. <laughs> 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 so um, they should probably have a sex therapist in there to... I mean, my issue with this, as a meat eater, and I will continue being a meat eater, is that by this logic, Emily, I would have to end up having sex only with hangry vegans. <laughs> and I can't imagine anything worse <laughs> in the world than that. So I mean, this is like... We're heading into the Dante's Inferno, right? I don't really I was... understand the sex connection. Why? Well, I do think we all should well, eat less meat. Look, it's Maybe because we vegans should. are we joyless and humourless and they want to suck all the pleasure out of life. That's why. I, I'm struck by the, uh, the spokesman who was saying, you know, that, that all these men, that they're grilling sausages on the grill, mm. and, and if you bring a courgette, everyone's very cross. He's obsessed with sausages and yes. courgette. Yeah. Somebody is not getting enough sex, are well, they? Clearly. And also, I'm obsessed with sausages, and here's my message to Peter, if you're watching, which is, I'm going to carry on having my bangers, thank you very much, <laughs> in every sense. So... Mm. Oh, mm. <laughs> Lovely. Sausage, anybody? Uh, I'm... <laughs> I shouldn't be caught on TV eating a sausage. What I want to talk to my panel. Thank you for coming in. What a that's delight. Right. A delight to have you. Uh, that's enough of my panel for tonight, unfortunately. We're going to move on to much more serious matters, which is Ukraine, war and Vladimir Putin. As the Russian dictator ramps up threats of nuclear war, Dr Jordan Peterson tells me exclusively why the Russian president isn't one to bluff. If necessary, they'll use a tactical battlefield weapon. Even yes. if it starts World War III? It won't. Probably. Why? Because we wouldn't respond?
This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Clinical psychologist Dr Jordan Peterson is one of the world's most fascinating and controversial intellectuals. His books sell by the boatload. His talks pack theatres across the globe. Millions watch him online. When he speaks, people listen. I interviewed him earlier today at length, and we'll air most of that conversation next week. But on the day that Putin threatened nuclear war on the West, I had to ask Jordan Peterson for his analysis on the war in Ukraine. His response was as grave as it was startling. That's the world's most famous psychologist, and began by asking for his view on Vladimir Putin as a man. Well, he's a lot more like everybody else than anyone thinks. You know, the notion that he's Hitler or Stalin, that's just foolish. I don't see any evidence for that at all. I mean, first of all, Hitler and Stalin were very singular types, and there's a bit of Hitler and Stalin in everyone, so, you know, there's some truth in that. Maybe there's more in the typical Russian leader A bit of Hitler normal. in everyone? Really? There's more than a bit. Really? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, why would have Nazism spread the way it did? You know, people think, well, that's all top-down. It's not top-down. There's, there's a part of people that... All these people who informed on Kate Burblesing. Well, didn't Goebbels, didn't Goebbels say that the way to get vast numbers of people to go along with what you want to do is to terrify them? You, yeah, you, well, that you, you, you can do that. You hold a grip of terror over them. Oh, yeah, but... And in a way, that's what Putin's now doing with the Russian people, they, where he's, he's going back now into a position of they're all trying to get us, they want to attack yeah, us, yeah, they yeah. want to take us over. He's terrifying his people to rally support for what, at the moment, is a conflict he has started, which is not going the way he assumed. Well, the most... Um, what would you say, the wisest commentators on totalitarian states like, like Solzhenitsyn and, and many psychological mm. commentators, Jung was a good example of that, made a very s straightforward case that you can't have a totalitarian state unless every single person is willing to lie about everything all the time. And you can think about that as top-down because the leaders lie too. Mm. And they also enforce punishments if you don't lie. But then you can also think about it the, the totalitarian spirit is replicated at every level of the society. And so in a truly totalitarian state, husbands lie to their wives and parents lie to their children. And the totalitarian state is actually the grip of the lie. And so, and, and people will certainly go along with that. I mean, I mean, I mean we're seeing that emerge here with cancel culture. It's like, lie yes. or else. Yes. It's like, yeah, well. And the Russian people will be bombarded all the time with state media propaganda and will be buying into a lot of what Putin is saying. Yeah. How does this war end, do you think? We're going to find out this winter. Well, I, I, I know what I would do in his shoes. Mm. I'd wait till the first cold snap and shut off the taps. Right. Well, because of course he has, he's going to do that. He's got the control over the energy. Well, of, of course he's going to do that. He's already warned the West with his insistence that maintenance problems were necessary and the pipelines had to be shut down. Do you think he will down. use a nuclear weapon? If necessary, he'll use a tactical battlefield weapon. Even yes. if it starts World War Three, It won't, probably. Why? Because we wouldn't respond? What's in it for us? If you let him do it and get away with it, where does that end? Then you are into a hit. Well, there's a lot. you can get yourself in a situation, no problem, where there's no good outcome. Mm. We're trying to do that right now on every front we can possibly imagine. Mm. We can easily get ourselves in a situation where it's hell this way and hell that way. That... We're, that's highly probable. Well, should the Ukrainians give the Russians anything? When I was over there recently interviewing President Zelensky, what I was struck by was everybody I met in Kyiv, the capital city, were utterly resolute. Don't give them an inch of our land. Yeah, well, I, don't, I can't speak to that because I don't know what the preconditions for peace might be. But I do know that naive notions that the Russians are going to lose somehow or that we're going to win, I, I, don't, I just don't understand. I don't understand that. Well, what do you mean we're going to win? What are we going to win here exactly? Well, I guess a victory would be that the Russians retreated from Ukraine. With, with Ukraine in ruins. Right. Well, we, that, we okay, fine. Of that's a hell of a victory. Like, I think Putin could manage that because I think he could tell his people, and I think they might buy it. It's like... We accomplished our objective. We devastated Ukraine and we kept it out of the hands of the West. And that's not great. It's not what we had hoped for, but it's better than the alternative. And I think they would buy that. And I think when, when Putin went into Ukraine, I thought, 
well, I thought a bunch of things, which I, I made a YouTube video about that. People criticized like mad. I thought, okay, well, what's happening here? Oh, I see. His, his end game for failure is that, ru- that Ukraine is left in a smoking ruin. Mm. Oh, that's a victory. So then he can lose with impunity. Right. So how can we win? We can't win against Vladimir Putin anyways, because you cannot win against someone you cannot say no to. Period. And we can't say no to Putin because we sold our soul for his oil and gas. Mm. And we did that to elevate our moral stature in relationship to saving the planet. And so here we are yeah. facing a very dire winter, hoisted on the petard of our own foolishness and moral presumption. Mm. We're saving the planet. We'll see. I don't think so. It doesn't look like it to me. And this is, this is the most catastrophic issue here. Assuming that we're facing an environmental crisis of planetary proportions, which is not something I buy, by the way, assuming we are, well, then I would imagine that you would put in place measures that would ameliorate that problem instead of exacerbating it. But all the measures you're putting in place are actually making the environmental problem worse. So how is that even vaguely acceptable? And I look at that and I think, Oh, I see. It's just like George Orwell said about middle-class socialists 50 years ago. It's not that you love the planet. It's that you hate humanity. So, well, have at her, boys and girls. And we'll see what happens this winter. And it's very terrifying to me. It is. Especially here, you know, because your energy prices have gone way out of control. And that's going to hurt a lot of poor people. Mm. And, and certainly around the world as well. The world bank already estimated that we put 350 million people into what they call a food insecurity. 350 million. That's three times as many as the communists managed to kill. Maybe we can manage that in a winter. But the planet has too many people on it anyway. So, you know, that's just poor people. Fascinating take from Jordan Peterson. We'll be showing a full interview with this extremely fascinating and compelling intellectual uh, next week. Uh, He's certainly a guy who gets everyone talking, and I really recommend you watch it. Uh, There were several moments which took me by surprise. One was when he got very emotional, my stage of the interview. Another, when I asked him if he could analyse me. And to say... You're a net force for good, if you want to be. Having met me now for an hour... What would your initial clinical diagnosis be? Well, you'll get that answer next week. I'll keep you on tender hooks, but it's quite fascinating, I have to say. Well, Jordan Peterson says the West can't beat Vladimir Putin. Is he right? And are we facing potential nuclear war? I'll be getting reaction to that with former US National Security Council official Robert Spaulding and best-selling author Douglas Murray and former advisor to President Putin, Sergei Markov. That's next.
Well, before the break, we heard controversial clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson tell me this about Putin's nuclear war. He said that basically we can't win. We can't beat the guy because we're too reliant on him for energy. Well, former White House National Security Council official, Brigadier General Robert Spaulding, best-selling author Douglas Murray, and former advisor to President Putin, Sergei Markov, all join me now. Let me start with you, if I may, uh, Brigadier General Spaulding. What did you make of, of Jordan Peterson saying that he believes we're too beholden to Vladimir Putin on energy for us to get any win here? Well, I, I do think that he has a point in that Putin is not really going to be beaten in this. And I think it has really less to do with energy and really more to do with what we're willing to risk in order to uh, create a military victory here. And I think you know, we, there's a good um, predicate for what's happening in Ukraine, and that is the Korean War. So we went back and forth in the Korean War uh, with an adversary that didn't have nuclear weapons in China at the time. And so I think we need to think very clearly uh, with regard to what are our aspirations and understand that this is a Cold War that will last for probably decades. And these, this is just the opening salvo. OK, let me go to Sergei Markov in Moscow, an advisor to Vladimir Putin, a former member of the Russian State Duma. Uh, thank you for joining me, uh, Mr. Markov. You were on the airwaves this morning in Britain. Uh, saying that Putin's made it clear he'll be ready to use his nuclear arsenal against Western countries, including against Great Britain, and that it would all be our fault because we've been the aggressors. Is, is that your position? Uh, of course. Uh, and of course, Vladimir Putin don't want nuclear war, as every normal psychological uh, person. And uh, believe me, Vladimir Putin very, very normal psychologically. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, we can see this war in uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's a lot of uh, psychology and irrationality. It's more personal war of Joe Biden against Vladimir Putin, uh, whom uh, Joe Biden hate. Uh, I can explain why. Well, was, it, well, hang on. Was, it, was it Joe Biden that invaded Ukraine? I must have, I must have missed that. Because I could have no, been, no, no. I could have been sure that in yeah. February Vladimir Putin, you the elite, point. well, hang on, let, you me, the, let me ask you a question. You the let point. me ask you a question, you Mr. Markov. Let's try and keep it reasonable. As far as I'm aware, it was Vladimir Putin that illegally invaded a sovereign no. democratic country, Ukraine, in February. No. It wasn't Joe Biden? No, no, no. You lost, you lost the point. Um, uh, uh, Russia uh, didn't invade Ukraine, but Russia sent troops to liberate Ukraine from occupation uh, a repressive regime, which uh, had been imposed by the United States to the Ukrainian people who is no, no, Russian. no, Russia did invade Ukraine, and, and no. that's, just a, that's just an undeniable fact. Russia invaded Ukraine. You know, it is rampaged you know, around want, Ukraine, bombing want, civilians, deny, bombing women, bombing you, children, you bombing maternity deny, hospitals. Okay, okay. It's, it's a religious discussion. You find Sorry, this funny? You're, you're not hooligan in the park, no? You find uh, this funny, see, Mr. Markov, do you? you don't, the you bombing don't of children, you find funny? You don't allow me to speak. If you, it's uh, your style of dialogue, not to allow people to express with you. I remember that when you discussed with these American generals, you had absolutely another style of talking. Please be not rude. Okay? So I continue. You lost the point. United States, I was wrong, last Democratic elected president of Ukraine 2014, imposed a repressive regime. By the way, if you know, 70% uh, of people in Ukraine, they are Russians. They speak Russian. Yeah, yeah but Ukraine voted. Uh, yeah, OK. All right, let me, speak Russian. If I may jump Can in. You, you Ukraine, the, the, the Ukrainian Russia. people. Mr. Markov, stop to shouting. Speak. Stop shouting. The Ukrainian people okay. voted overwhelmingly for democracy. They continue to support no. democracy. They don't no. want to be part of the old Soviet no. Union. Well, they did. No. It's just a, it's a demonstrable no. fact. No. No. Uh, in Ukraine, all elections after the military coup of 2014 can be pacified. Right. It was terror. Now, dozens of thousands of people are uh, either uh, political prisoners. And I'm oh, asking you, Mr. Mr. Markov, Mr. Markov, start, the truth start, is, all right, but Vladimir Putin, your, yeah, your friend I Vladimir start, Putin, I, if I may say so, I say, 
we can't keep talking over each other, Mr Markov, but let me say this to you. Vladimir Putin is clearly losing this war or he wouldn't now be mobilising 300,000 reservists. He wouldn't have been losing territory that he gained. The no. Russians are losing the war and that is why no. Vladimir Putin is now taking these extreme measures. No. What I, uh, Vladimir Putin wants you uh, 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 to know, if Joe Biden and your prime ministers, almost crazy, I think Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, uh, uh, will continue their hybrid war against Russia, it will could lead to the irrational scenario where nobody will control and, in fact, will have nuclear war and, in fact, Russia, Russian rocket missiles yeah, I will... I will say, I find the, threat, the, and, the constant threats from Russia about nuclear weapons are, frankly, pathetic. No. Absolutely pathetic. It's behaving like a bully in the school playground. Anyway, Mr Markov, I've got to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining me. Let's go to Douglas Murray in New York. Douglas, um, obviously a, a ridiculous conversation in many ways, but what is your take on the reality, do you think? No, Mr Markov, we're done. I'm so sorry. Um, Douglas, tell me about the, the situation from your perspective here. We've only got a few minutes left, but where are we with this, this supposed conflict? It was obviously a war. Well, obviously, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine earlier this year, and what we've just heard is very typical Kremlin propaganda, which, which uh, some people believe, and they've managed to persuade uh, much of the Russian public to believe, and others just are doing this cynically for cynical political reasons. But uh, the, the interesting thing, of course, is that the, the course of this war so far is that it has been undeniably a huge failure for Vladimir Putin. His forces did not manage to get to Kiev uh, uh, as they wanted to in the initial days. Uh, Zelensky and the Ukrainian government did not flee. It turned out that Russia's supply chains were totally inadequate. It turned out that the billions of dollars they'd paid for uh, in, a, in a military tech, in a tech, tech system that was meant to allow generals and others to speak on, on secure lines was, surprise, surprise, mainly money that had gone in corruption and kickbacks like everything else in Putin's Russia and didn't work. And so Russia's been losing senior generals. It's now, of course, not winning. Of course it's not winning. If you have to call up 300,000 reservists, uh, um, most of whom are going to be completely untrained, then of course you're not winning. The interesting question, though, is this from the point of view of the West. Uh, how long can this conflict be drawn out? It seems to me, of course, that the, the, the dangerous thing, and my friend Jordan Peterson mentioned this earlier, that the dangerous thing is this winter. Vladimir Putin will be hoping to hive off at least one member of the Western alliance as the energy problem gets worse into the winter. But this conflict's clearly going to go into next year. Now, here's the problem, if I can say so, and one we should all be thinking about is Vladimir Putin's going to, in some sense, lose this war, but not completely. Mm. And that's not entirely a bad thing, because the most dangerous scenario, and I think we've just had one of his sort of puppet blowhards that we've just heard from, yeah. the most dangerous scenario is undoubtedly Vladimir Putin losing humiliatingly. Because a humiliated Putin is, I think, the most dangerous Putin. And, and that's why I think for all of our hopes that, you know, Russia can be completely thrown out of Ukraine and this illegal war can be reversed to the status quo ante, for all of our hopes of that, the reality is that at some point there's going to have to be some kind of discussion which allows Putin basically to retreat as magnanimously as possible. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I, this is what Jordan was saying, and I, I don't disagree with the sort of intellectual analysis of this, but just going back to the general spalling for a moment, that does mean in the end that Ukraine would have to surrender some more territory. And when I was over there recently, that was the last thing they wanted to do. But is that inevitable? Well, I think it's the same thing, as I said, that happened during the Korean War. I don't think the South Koreans are, you know, particularly happy about the uh, demilitarized zone, but it's something that we're going to have to um, find a way to coexist and let this long-term competition between authoritarianism and uh, democracies play out. One of the problems that I think that we have to come to grips with is that we are pouring enormous sums into China, who is in turn pouring enormous sums into Russia. That's not going to help us yeah. long term. It's not, not all, also not going to help us that they that China owns a supply chain, which is not something that we had during the first Cold War. So yeah. we've got a lot of com competing to do and a lot of work to do. And, you know, it's not just yeah. going to happen in Ukraine.
General, thank you very much indeed. Douglas Murray, thank you very much indeed. This will keep going. It's a huge developing story again in Ukraine. But that's it from me tonight. Whatever you're up to, keep it uncensored. Good night. What was my biggest career moment? After spending about 25 years in Fleet Street, there's loads of stories I could tell you. But actually, I think I did an overnight show for Tool Radio in the early days, the night of the Brexit referendum. And that was actually quite a milestone because, of course, we started off thinking um, that Remain had won. And at half past two, quarter to three, after Nigel Farage had already said he'd lost, it turned out he hadn't lost. And it turned out we were leaving the European Union. So that was quite a shocker. This is Talk TV News. Good evening, I'm Nadira Tudor. Five British prisoners of war have been released from Russia and are on their way back to the UK. Two of them, Aidan Aslin and Sean Pinner, had been sentenced to death. They were photographed arriving at Riyadh Airport. Both were accused of being mercenaries. Saudi Arabia helped negotiate the deal to free the group, which included ten prisoners of war in total. Meanwhile, Russians have been holding protests in the country's biggest cities tonight following a decision by Vladimir Putin to call up 300,000 reservists to fight in the war in Ukraine. Dozens have been arrested. And energy bills for businesses in the UK will be cut by around half their expected level this winter. The government will impose a price cap for six months from the 1st of October. Hospitals, schools and charities will also get some help. That's all for now. We'll have more after the talk.